to I, beforehand? I think in the interest of time, uh, we'll have you get started and then we'll, we'll address some questions that the audience uh, brings up at the end. I'll comment, this is one of our record attendance rates this Friday morning. We almost shattered uh, a record and got to 100 participants. So uh, definitely we've got a lot of people tuning in. So why, why don't we have you get started? Oh, I think you actually, you got rid of your presenter view. So we just Did see I, your slides. So you can just see my slides. Yeah, perfect. Okay, fantastic. Go ahead. So this is usually a topic uh, that I take a little bit longer to talk about. It's hard to condense all of Peroni's disease, um, non-surgical and surgical treatment into even just an hour. So doing so in about a half an hour, 40 minutes, I decided to take a larger topic, condense it into a, a, a smaller, um, more manageable topic for the, for the time period but then expand on that. So we're gonna be ta actually talking about current non-surgical treatments for Peyronie's disease. Now, if we look at Peyronie's disease in general, it's a very common problem which affects a million of men of all ages. It affects one's self-image, their confidence, and ultimately their quality of life. And most of, many, a lot of the time, many men will suffer in silence without even seeing a qualified specialist. Sometimes they will present early on in the disease, but oftentimes we'll find men who go six, 12, even 24 months before presenting um, to the clinician, either a primary care doctor or the urologist for evaluation and treatment. And this becomes really concerning, not only for men, but also for the partners. It really results in a depression and anxiety, which I'll show you in a few slides, lower level of physical and emotional intimacy. It can result in a lower level of satisfaction within a relationship and can even affect interpersonal relationships. As an outline today, we're gonna to talk about the background of Peyronie's disease, what we should do in terms of an initial evaluation, workup, and then non-surgical treatments. As an overview, Peyronie's disease is a fibrotic disorder of the tunica albuginea. It's clinically defined by the presence of a palpable and an inelastic plaque. It usually presents as an abnormal curvature or an indentation of the penis, but may present uh, with pain or even erectile dysfunction. It results from an increased collagen type three deposition and decreased elastin resulting from repetitive microvascular trauma, which is thought to occur in men who have a genetic predisposition for this. It usually occurs in the sixth and seventh decades of life, but about 5% of men under 40 years old may have Peyronie's disease. So Peyronie's disease was first named after the French uh, surgeon, Francois Gigot de la Peyronie, all the way back in 1743. The estimated prevalence of Peyronie's disease is anywhere between 0.5 to 13 percent, but probably more common in the U.S. is probably somewhere between 6 to 9 percent. It's associated with Deputrin's contracture. Uh, Deputrin's is uh, present about 21 percent of men who present with Peyronie's disease. It's associated with diabetes, Paget's disease, and also a history of radical prostatectomy, which I'll also show you in a couple slides. It is divided into two different phases. There's the active or acute phase and the chronic phase with a pretty unpredictable clinical course. The active or acute phase is usually where things are changing. So there might, there's gonna be a change in curvature, uh, there's, there could be pain, there could be a change in erectile function. And it's usually once you have six to 12 months of uh, curvature stability and usually pain-free where patients enter the chronic phase. Peyronie's disease is thought to occur from a, from a trauma. Uh, it's also thought to occur in genetically predisposed men. Uh, the trauma then results in tunica delamination, microvascular injury, fibrin trapping, and an inflammatory cascade, which results in increase in TGF beta, cytokine overexpression, react, reactive oxygen generation, which then causes cellular pr proliferation, extracellular matrix changes. And an end result being uh, the Peyronie's plaque, which we've all felt. If you look at overall prevalence, it does change based on a region. So if you look at the US, prevalence is somewhere between six to 9%. In Italy, somewhere around 7%. And then if you look at Germany and Brazil, it's much less. And if you look at the Chinese population, it's very rare um, in their population. If you look at the natural history of Peyronie's disease, so what do I mean by that? You have a man that presents in the active phase and you, you offer no intervention or treatment. About 12 to 13% of men will actually get better over time in the active phase. About 40 to 45% of men will actually stay stable and about 40 to 45%, so the remaining of the patients will actually get worse. 
So rough estimate, you have a 50-50 chance of either uh, getting better, staying stable versus getting worse. If you look at men uh, after radical prostatectomy, Dr. Mohol was actually one of the first to show us that the incidence of Peyronie's disease is actually higher in men after radical prostatectomy. It's anywhere between 16 to 18% of men. And men may present um, with a curvature, which is most common, but also two thirds of men can present with a palpable plaque. Interestingly, there's no association between grade or stage of prostate cancer and the development of Peyronie's disease. Nurse sparing versus non-nurse sparing doesn't seem to make a difference. And uh, intraoperative uh, variations also don't seem to change the, uh, the incidence of, of post-radical prostatectomy Peyronie's disease. It is associated with white men who are younger than 60 years old. So why do we care? Well, obviously we care, one, because uh, Peyronie's disease can cause a functional abnormality, um, but as importantly, it also has a significant psychological aspect on our patients. Now, 81% of men will present with some emotional difficulties, and as many as half of men, 50% of men, will not only have relationship issues, but actually present with clinical depression as a result of the Peyronie's disease. So when we're seeing these patients and evaluating these men, it's important not only to kind of address the physical aspect, but somewhat the psychological and emotional aspect of, of this disease as well. Overall, when you assess a man that's presenting with Peyronie's disease, you really want to understand the onset. Did this start two weeks ago or did this start two years ago? Was there a trauma or inciting event that happened? Um, and you want to get a good assessment of their curvature, um, their direction of curvature and their degree of curvature. Now there's poor correlation between a patient reported curvature and the actual curvature that you might see on a picture or in an in-office assessment, but it's important to get the patient's perspective of what they think their curvature is. You also want to know, importantly, what the erectile function is currently. Uh, and if there's any penile instability or hinge effect um, with, their, with their erections. You wanna ask them about pain. You wanna ask them about how stable their curvature has been. And you also wanna know what kind of medications or prior treatment they've had so you don't repeat things. And probably as important, if not more important, as all these other factors is you really wanna understand how bothered they are by this, uh, by their Peyronie's disease. If they're able to have sexual activity uh, with minimal problems and they're minimally bothered by their current curvature and they're just there to get a little bit more information, that's going to be a lot different conversation, much different conversation than a man who's presenting with severe distress, inability to be sexually active with his partner, uh, and a severe curvature. So what are some factors? We talked about some factors that are going to dictate treatment. So disease stability is going to be important. If they're in the active phase, you might consider observing them. You might consider, consider some, some medications if they have pain, like non-inflammatory NSAIDs, um, or even PDA5 inhibitors and antioxidants that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, if, they're have, if they're more bothered um, and you're thinking about an interventional treatment like intralesional injections or surgery, then you really want to do a curvature assessment. And you could do that by a number of ways. You can have the patient bring uh, photos in. You can assess them using a vacuum erection device. But most importantly, most accurately, is going to be with an in-office assessment with in intracavernosal injection and then using a goniometer to measure the curvature. At the same time, it's really important to assess the erectile function. And one um, non-invasive way that you can do that is using the penile Doppler at the time of the in-office assessment with your intracavernosal injection. When we think about erectile dysfunction or erectile function in men with Peyronie's disease, we really wanna understand what's causing this erectile dysfunction. Cause again, that's gonna help dictate uh, your treatment protocol and your recommendations. Is there erectile dysfunction because they have performance anxiety related to their penile deformity? Uh, do they have a flail or hinge penis which causes uh, distal penile instability? Is the fibrosis from the Peyronie's disease causing a venoocclusive disorder? Or do they have an underlying arteriogenic or organic cause of the erectile dysfunction? And all this can kind of be parsed out using uh, penile Doppler as well. So moving on to treatment options. Well, non-surgical treatment options have actually been available since the 1700s when it was first described. 
by De La Peroni. Things like arsenic, radiation therapy, UV light, vitamin E, laser ablation, more recently in the 90s interferon and verapamil injections, and, and much more recently medications have all been described for the non-surgical and medical treatment of Peroni's disease. Luckily, in 2015, the AUA put out Peroni's disease guidelines uh, and uh, really condensed all the prior literature and information into a very nice succinct document to help us understand what the evidence is um, and what treatment protocols actually uh, were beneficial. So what they said in, in basically in synopsis is basically vitamin E, potaba, tamoxifen, colchicine, and carnitine had very little benefit or no benefit in the treatment of Peroni's disease. They, they, all, they went on to say that petoxyphylline, which is thought to downregulate TGF beta and L-arginine or PD5 inhibitors, which is thought to block the effects of, of TGF beta, had some benefit and uh, improved in vitro and in vivo in improvement in, in plaque and also penile curvature. One of the first studies looking at tadalafil use uh, with Peroni's disease came out of the SMSNA. It was an open label a study using tadalafil five milligrams a day. And what the authors found was about 42% of men had a decrease in curvature in the active phase between 20 and 40 degrees, and up to 17% had a complete resolution of their curvature. Dr. Brock uh, group published um, an article in 2011 in the Journal of Sexual Medicine, and he looked at men with septal plaques treated with uh, two and a half milligrams of daily tadalafil. And what he found is about 70% of men had actually a resolution of their septal plaque versus 10% of controls. So this is uh, some of the evidence that supports potential use of, of tadalafil in, in the active phase. What about intralesional injections for the treatment of Peroni's disease? Well, intralesional injections have also been around uh, for about 30, 40 years. These next two slides I took with the um, uh, permission of Dr. Mohol. Um, this shows Dr. Hellstrom, who first popularized the use of interferon, uh, intralesional injections. And basically, you can see a, on the right side a wide range of, of success with this use. Anywhere between 3 to 67% of men had a decrease in curvature um, with use of interferon. Similarly, Dr. Levine popularized the use of arapamol injections. And also, most of the studies show anywhere between a third to two thirds of men will have some decrease in curvature using intralesional injections of verapamil. These are done as biweekly injections for six to 12, uh, for six to 12 uh, cycle, uh, cycles. Up until um, you know, a few years ago, where there was an actual FDA approved treatment for Peroni's disease in terms of intralesional injection, which we'll get to in a minute, these are really the, the mainstays of medical Peroni's disease treatment. So going back to the Peroni's disease uh, AUA guidelines, if you look at guideline number eight and nine, the, the AUA um, with moderate recommendation suggests uh, considering using intralesional collagenase clostridium histolyticum, which I'll call CCH, also known as Iaplex, in combination with modeling by clinicians for reduction in penile curvature with men with stable Peroni's disease and curvatures between 30 and 90 degrees. They go on to recommend that patients should counsel patients about the potential risks of use of this medication and potential adverse events. So what is CCH? Well, it's a group of proteolytic enzymes first described in the 1950s. It was first used to treat the pretrans contraction, first described for Peroni's disease in the 80s. Main mechanism of action is to cleave type one and type three collagen. Uh, and it was the first and only FDA approved medical treatment for Peroni's disease, which was approved back in December of 2013. The approval was based on data from phase 2B and phase 3 clinical trials. The two phase 3 landmark clinical trials that led to the approval of, of Zyflex were called the IMPRESS trials. And they were basically two identical double-blind placebo-controlled trials, IMPRESS 1 and IMPRESS 2, involved 32 sites. And each study randomized patients 2 to 1 to receive either eight injections of of Zyflex or CCH to placebo. And primary outcomes were percent improvement in penile deformity and improvement in, uh, in Peroni's disease questionnaire bothered domain score. 
These trials enrolled 832 men. They enrolled men with dorsal or lateral curvature of 30 to 90 degrees. And they, these men had to have curvature stability for greater than one year. And again, patients received eight injections over four cycles and were followed for one year. If you look at the IMPRESS-1 trial, men who were in the treatment arm had about a 35% decrease in penile curvature uh, at one year compared to uh, about an 18% decrease in penile curvature in the placebo arm. Similarly, similarly in the IMPRESS-2 trial, men in the treatment arm had a 33% decrease in penile curvature versus a 22% decrease in the placebo arm. In aggregate, overall, the mean percent change in the treatment arm was about 34% compared to a decrease in curvature of about 18% in the placebo arm. And this correlated to about a 17, on average, a 17 degree decrease in penile curvature from start to finish in the treatment arm. Now, CCH is not without complications. As many as 85% of men will have some sort of adverse event uh, to the injections. The most common are gonna be bruising, swelling, hematoma, pain, itching, painful erections. But the most common and dreaded of all, of course, is gonna be about a half to 1% risk of penile fracture in men treated with, uh, with Zyaflex. So if we look at the FDA approved regimen, each cycle involves two injections of Zyaflex separated by one to three days and a subsequent practitioner in-office manual modeling one to three days following the second of the two injections. And then the recommendation is to repeat these cycles up to four times in six week intervals. So in total, we're talking about 12 visits over an 18 week or 14 month period. So what's the downside? Well, I think the downside to the current regimen is a significant time commitment on the patient and the practitioner. This translates to increased cost in healthcare system to the patient and the healthcare system. There is a high adverse uh, event rate with each injection and treatment, and there's incomplete ac applicability. So if we're only using these in men with 30 to 90 degree curvature. We can't use these in men with acute phase. And what about men with ventral curvature? So many of us look to um, um, in the post FDA approved era for novel applications to expand the, expand the applicability of CCH and also decrease the time commitment. So novel applications have looked at decreasing the number of visits needed, needed for treatment, increasing the applicability and improving the clinical outcomes. Dr. Trost's group was one of the first to look at his cohort of patients in the post FDA approved era. He retrospectively analyzed 69 patients and he instructed those patients to instead of come in for uh, in office modeling to perform their modeling at home. And he recommended patients to manually uh, manipulate their flaccid penis for 30 seconds with each void and use penile traction for about an hour to three hours every day during the treatment course. His primary outcomes looked at change in penile curvature and patient reported outcomes. What their group found was a very similar results to the original IMPRESS trials, about an 18 degree improvement in penile curvature and a 35% improvement overall in penile curvature. What they also found was just as important was that uh, with each subsequent cycle or intervention, patients reported a meaningful, um, a meaningful improvement in, in penile curvature and, and sexual performance. So these authors concluded that not only at-home modeling was safe and effective uh, to the adjunct, um, but it did not negatively impact success rates. Dr. Nelson was also, Dr. Bennett was also one of the first to report on, on his series in, in the post-FDA approved era. And he not only incorporated at-home modeling, but he also included patients with atypical deformities and patients in the active phase of Peroni's disease. He also found an overall mean decrease in penile curvature by about 15 degrees or 32%. But in his cohort, he had about a quarter patients in the active phase who had a mean decrease in penile curvature by 20 degrees. And they concluded that at-home modeling was safe and effective, but also questioned the use of CCH as a disease modifier for Peroni's disease in the active phase. Now, Dr. Hellstrom's group took this one step forward and, and they actually questioned the utility of the fourth cycle. 
And what you can see here is that there's a significant decrease or improvement in penile curvature after the first three cycles. But for what you can see here is with the fourth cycle out to the final assessment, there was actually no change in penile curvature. So they argued that CCH was just as effective in three cycles as it would be in four cycles. So now at this point, we've taken out uh, the third office visit and we've taken out potentially the fourth cycle. So we decreased the two office visits over, uh, over three cycles with a very similar uh, improvement in penile curvature. Now, if you look over to uh, some data in Europe, they took a completely different perspective and they tried to develop a new modified shortened protocol for Peroni's disease. And what Dr. Ralph's group tried to do is instead of having two injections per cycle, they condensed that down into one injection per cycle. And instead of having six week intervals between cycles, they decreased that to four week intervals. So instead of having potentially 12 to 14 visits over 18 to 24 weeks, they condensed their protocol down to four visits over 12 weeks. And not surprisingly, they found very similar results with a mean decrease in uh, overall curvature of roughly 17 degrees correlating to about a 31% improvement in penile curvature. They also subdivided based on severity of curvature and showed that no matter how minimal or severe the curvature is, there are similar improvements over the treatment course. So lastly, um, I wanna just talk about you know, acute phase disease. Uh, Dr. Helsham's group went, looked to to, to uh, address the question of whether this could be a disease modifier. And so he have subdivided his group into patients who are in the active phase or the acute phase versus the stable phase. And what he found was that basically very similar results between the two groups, about a 16 degree improvement to 17 degree improvement in penile curvature using CCH, whether men are in their active phase or stable phase, arguing that you really don't have to wait for men to become stable to intervene with an intralesional injection. He also showed similar results uh, between the two groups, no matter which cycle they were in. So last thing that I didn't address is what about atypical curvatures or ventral plaques or curvatures? Well, CCH has been actively studying the treatment of urethral stricture disease. The reason I say this is one of the concerns with using uh, CCH for a ventral plaque was potentially higher risk of penile fracture or even potential risk of urethral injury or stricture formation. One of the first reports of using Zyflex uh, in a ventral uh, plaque was um, presented at the SMSNA in 2015, where two patients were treated with CCH, and both patients had a significant improvement in penile curvature with no long-term side effects. More recently, in 2019, again, Dr. Trost group published on his series, and they actually had 11% of men with ventral curvatures. And interestingly enough, if you look all the way to the right, men treated with CCH who had ventral curvatures had a significantly higher improvement in penile curvature when compared to men with lateral or dorsal curvatures. Men with ventral curvatures actually improved by, on average, 50% compared to men with lateral curvatures who improved by about 38% and dorsal curvatures who had the worst improvement, about 25%. When, look, when delving a little bit deeper, men with ventral plaques actually were more likely to have a greater than 50% improvement seen here by the dark blue bars. They were more likely to have a greater than 75% improvement and a greater than 90% improvement compared to men with lateral plaques or dorsal plaques. So in summary, CCH, although not the holy grail, of Peroni's disease treatment by any stretch of the imagination is the only FDA approved non-surgical treatment for Peroni's disease. The current protocol reg regimens are time and resource consuming, but there are alternative protocols which have been proven to be safe and effective as the standard protocols. An expansion of inclusion criteria may be considered a proper counseling for men with active phase of disease and also with men with uh, atypical curvatures or ventral curvatures. Now, before I, I, uh, I end here, I do just wanna briefly touch on surgery and, and, and indications for surgery and what we need to think about um, when we are counseling patients for, for surgery. So if we're gonna consider a man for surgery, we wanna make sure our, 
try and make sure that he's pain-free and has stable deformity for at least six months, so no change in curvature for at least six months. Um, we want to understand whether their deformity actually impairs sexual activity. Um, if they have severe erectile dysfunction, then that would be a, a, an indication for surgery. If they have penile instability, uh, men who have ex extensive plaque calcifications, which you can see with shadowing on a, on a penile ultrasound, probably aren't good candidates for conservative treatment or for intralesional injections. And those men should probably be counseled on surgery up front. And then of course, if, they've ha if men have had not failed non-surgical treatment uh, and require additional treatment, those are also uh, men that you would talk su to surgery about. Interestingly enough, about 50% of men who have uh, 50 to 60% of men who undergo um, Zyflex treatment um, will forego the need um, for surgery. When you're gonna consider surgery and the type of surgery you're gonna perform, things to consider are gonna be the nature of the deformity, whether there's an hourglass deformity, whether there's a, a complex multiplanar curvature. You wanna consider the location of the deformity, uh, which will dictate potentially the site of your incision. You also want to understand the erectile function. If they have poor erectile function, you probably just counsel them on a penile implant. Uh, you want to understand, you know, the penile volume and, and dimensions. And also, just as importantly to any of this, is really surgeon's experience uh, with the various surgical options and patient preference uh, for surgery as well. Lastly, this probably goes without saying, but surgical management goals are aimed at not only correcting penile deformity, but preserving penile volume, penile length as much as possible and preserving erectile function. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for spending their Friday morning listening to me and uh, happy to field any questions. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks for wrapping up um, the series on sexual uh, medicine talks with us this morning. Um, see, in terms of questions, can you talk a little bit about um, um, your technique for um, Peroni's disease surgery? Um, maybe a little bit more about when you would consider concomitant placement of a prosthesis and um, your threshold for using certain types of grafts, what grafts you would use for cases of severe curvature. So um, there's a lot of pieces uh, to that question. Um, I think it, it all starts with, it really all starts with counseling. Um, some men are really averse to having any, any uh, surgical procedure done on their penis. At the same time, some men are very averse to having something injected into their penis. So I think a lot of treatment is going to be on a, um, uh, on a uh, case by case basis and with, a, with an open discussion. Um, in terms of uh, surgical options, you really have to do a good in office assessment to dictate what surgery uh, is gonna be best for that patient. I think um, a, man who has a, um, a man who has severe erectile dysfunction uh, and, and any curvature, you really wanna discuss a penile implant with them. And how you manage their curvature at the time of surgery is really gonna, again, depend on their, their deformity uh, and their curvature. You might get away with modeling alone um, uh, during surgery, you might have to do some incision of the grafting or of the, of the plaque, or you might even have to place, uh, you know, a, a graft over the defect, really depending on how large the defect is. You know, I might get um, uh, killed for saying this, but even in some men who have severe erectile dysfunction and uh, who might need an erect uh, a penile implant, if they have a severe curvature, sometimes I'll even choose to soften up the plaque um, uh, with, with Zyflex, Zyflex prior to the implant um, to see if I can get better outcomes uh, with modeling alone uh, during the time of surgery and have less manipulation during surgery and, and, and decrease the risk of, of infection. And Dr. Valenzuela posted a comment in the chat. What is your opinion um, of shockwave, extracorporeal shockwave therapy for patients with Peronis? Do you use it in your practice? So I, I don't use it for Peroni's disease. Um, I know in the guidelines, there is a, uh, um, a, not a recommendation, but an option to use um, a shock, low intensity shock wave uh, in the active phase for control of pain. 
with Peroni's disease. I don't choose to use it. It's not FDA approved. It's, an, it's expensive for patients. And I think the benefit from that with, in use with Peroni's disease is very minimal. There's no evidence to suggest that it improves uh, plaque size or curvature. And um, just uh, as likely, or it's just as easy to use uh, an anti-inflammatory a lot of times for their pain uh, than it is to, to use the, the shockwave. So no, I, I don't use it for Peroni's disease at all. I don't even offer it for Peroni's disease. And then can you, can you comment a little bit about um, your experience with using telemedicine for sexual medicine type of consults now that that has been a major shift uh, during our you know, pandemic experience? How do you find that modality working for you to, to uh, discuss issues like Peroni's disease? Sure. I think that's an excellent question. It's very relevant to the times. Um, luckily for me, I, I did incorporate telemedicine in my practice probably about a year ago. So once a week, Thursday afternoons, I'd have between six and 10 telemedicine visits. Up until recently, they, were, they could only be for follow-up visits. They really couldn't be for new patient visits. Um, but what I found now with new patient visits that are presenting either with infertility um, or, or, or sexual dysfunction, um, patients are really... Um, First of all, a lot of it is, is discussion, but the most important thing is nothing is going to substitute a good physical exam. But you'd be surprised what patients can do themselves in terms of a, a physical exam. I actually had a patient yesterday diagnose himself with a varicocele just by simple instructions. If I see a man with Peroni's disease and I'm on a telemedicine visit and I can't examine him in the office right away, I'll actually have him you know, on the video in a private room, kind of examine himself see if he can see any, uh, feel any uh, plaques. You'd be surprised um, how um, kind of uh, adapt uh, patients are to, to self-exam and to learning how, how to exam. And, and, and often you can incorporate it into your telehealth visit. Now, obviously you can't really do a curvature assessment with the video. You can't do a, an ultrasound, a Doppler ultrasound through video visit, but you can at least get the conversation started um, and then if you need to do a more in-depth evaluation or exam in the office, then you can bring them in as a, as a second step. And one final question. Um, how do you counsel patients, back, uh, going back to Peroni's disease specifically, how do you counsel patients complaining of loss of length with Peroni's disease uh, and the use of Zyaflex? So if they have a uniplanar, um, deformity. Um, so let's say they only have a dorsal curvature and you, you counsel them that on average they'll have about a 30% improvement. So let's say you have a man that has about a 45 degree curvature and on average you would expect his curvature to go from 45 degrees to 30 degrees. You know, he'll never regain, likely never regain with, with just Zyaflex his um, baseline or his pre peronis disease volume or length. But if you're gaining, if you're decreasing curvature, um, then you're gonna be increasing functional length. Um, so I do state that if he gets an improvement in curvature, he will have a mild improvement in, in penile length, but it's gonna be very difficult to get to his pre Peroni's disease uh, penile volume uh, without some sort of surgical intervention. And usually in those cases, you'll need a, you know, some sort of grafting if you're really trying to preserve length. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Kashanian, all three of our excellent speakers this morning, Dr. Valenzuela, Dr. Shadeshi Najad. I think that this really is, this today really symbolizes what Empire is about. It's people from different institutions coming together to, to educate residents on a, to, on a topic and a, and a theme this morning in sexual medicine. So, we really appreciate everyone's commitment to our section and to our residents and their education. You should all be commended. Um, next week is.